Thank you, uh, members. The next item of business is a motion to approve a statutory rule. I shall ask the clerk to please read the motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2 Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021 be approved. Thank you. I call the Minister for Health, Mr Robin Swan, to move the motion. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate. Before I invite the Minister to commence the debate, I remind members that there has been an arrest related to a gathering over the weekend. I do not want to inhibit discussion on the motion which asks the Assembly to approve legislation, but in accordance with my responsibilities, understanding Order 73, I would caution members to be particularly careful that they say nothing in their contribution to today's debate that may prejudice the outcome of any criminal proceedings. Members who deliberately flout the sub judice rule will be asked to resume their seat. I now call upon the Minister for Health, Mr Robin Swan, to open the debate on the motion. Minister. Um, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, today I am bringing forward for debate the First Amendment to the Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2 Regulations for 2021, SR No. 3 um, of 2021. With your permission, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I will set the context and briefly summarise the statutory rule. The current set of restrictions were introduced from the 26th of December to address the escalation in COVID positive cases and hospitalisations that had been predicted in the modelling just before Christmas. There were also enhanced restrictions between 8pm and 6am from the 26th of December until the 2nd of January, with an accompanying power for the PSNI to direct persons home where they were engaged in prohibited activity or intending to be so engaged. These amendments have been previously debated in the Chamber and I am grateful to the junior ministers for leading on those debates. At the time the amendments to the regulations were made, which brought into effect the current restrictions, it has and was the intention of the executive to maintain these restrictions for at least six weeks, and that would be until the 5th of February. At an executive meeting on 5th of January, I gave an update on the state of the epidemic at that point. This demonstrated that the, the case numbers had risen significantly over the Christmas period. The reproductive rate of the virus, the, the RT value, had risen to the upper end of the modelling limits and was close to 1.8, based on the recorded case numbers. That was accompanied with a significant increase in positive tests. It was clear that there had been a substantial increase in virus transmission as a result of the behaviours uh, during the pre-Christmas relaxations and Christmas social interaction and mixing. This was in line with the modelling projections the executive had considered uh, during December. The restrictions which had been in place since the 26th of December were not yet having a significant impact on the indicators of disease. It was expected their impact would be apparent in the data during the following one to two weeks. In the meantime, there was very significant and growing pressure on our hospital system and on critical care. These pressures were expected to continue to escalate and intensify against the backdrop of a system already under extraordinary and protracted strain. In order to ensure our health and social care system could manage the predicted peak levels of disease, and given the level of infection circulated in the community at the time, the Executive agreed that enhanced restrictions should be introduced with effect from Thursday, the 7th of January, to bear down on the rate of virus transmission. The amended regulations uh, we are debating today give effect to the changes agreed by the Executive at this point, uh, the first week of January. The amended regulations SR 2021 No. 3 included the following amendments. General restrictions on movement were introduced, similar to those used during the first lockdown in March last year, but adapted to take account of those activities not currently permitted. Indoor and outdoor gatherings were restricted to six persons from two households, with some exceptions. This is a reduction from the previous 15-person limit. Gathering and private dwellings were restricted, both indoors and outdoors, to one household, or one household and its linked household to a maximum of 10 persons. This aligned the restrictions on outdoor gatherings in private dwellings with the restrictions on indoor gatherings in private dwellings. The exercise provision was amended to permit exercise alone with, one for, with your own household, with a member of your own bubble or with one other person. 
the power for the PSNI to direct persons home was reintroduced, as was previously in place from the 26th of December to the 2nd of January only. These regulations come into operation at midnight on the 7th of January and remain in place today. Whilst they were all individually important, I do believe the importance, not just in effect but also in simplicity, of the legal stay-at-home message cannot be overstated. The mobility data in the weeks before Christmas very clearly, very clearly suggested that the stay-at-home and work-from-home guidance was not being adhered to sufficiently and was far from the levels experienced during the first lockdown in March last year. In addition, I had also regularly suggested to executive colleagues that a high-visibility policing operation through an increased presence of vehicle checkpoints, for instance, would send a clear message to the general public. I believe these restrictions were a measured and proportionate response to the information which was available at the time. The trajectory of the epidemic since their introduction has demonstrated these restrictions are having a positive effect on infection rates. However, we are not yet where we need to be, and there is absolutely no room for complacency at this time. The restrictions continue to be necessary today if we are to protect the health of our population. As the hospitals continue to be operating at a very high level of occupancy, uh, this will take some weeks and months to work through. We need to drive down the level of virus circulating in the general population to a greater degree to allow the health service to regain its capacity to treat both COVID and non-COVID patients alike. This is why, informed by the latest modelling and projections for the disease, and the executive agreed subsequently, when the regulations were reviewed in the third week of January, that the current restrictions should and would be extended for a further month up until the 5th of March. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I hope that provides you with a summary of the context in which these regulations were made and an outline of their content. And I commend the regulations to the Assembly. Thank you, Minister. I call the Chair of the Health Committee, Mr Colm Gildernew. The Health Committee understands all too well the impact that th this pandemic has had not only on our health service and staff, as referred to you at the outset of your remarks, Minister, but on all of our people right across the North and indeed right across the island. I am very conscious this morning, this afternoon, that as we, as we discuss these regulations, taking the combined NISRA and the figures in the 26 counties, there are now 6,134 people have lost their lives to COVID every one of which is an individual family and community tragedy, and every one of which I send sympathy and condolences to. These past 11 months have been difficult for everyone, and I want to thank the vast majority of people who have followed the restrictions that have been put in place. It is with great difficulty that the Committee has considered these statutory rules that place restrictions not only on what we can do, but on our interactions with family and friends. However, we understand that we need to do all we can to reduce the pressure on our health service and its staff, who are working under extreme pressure. We are also thankful for the continued rollout of the vaccine programme, and it does provide us with hope that there will be an end to these restrictions. This specific rule came into operation on 7 January and makes a number of provisions, including restricting gatherings, introducing restrictions on movement from home, and introducing a power to direct people to return home. The Committee was briefed by the Department on this rule on the 20th of January. I would note that the Committee received very late notice of the briefing and the rule and accompanying papers had to be tabled at the meeting, giving members minimum opportunity to consider the rules. I have previously outlined on prior regulations the urgency with which these regulations are being made and the resulting lack of prior engagement. The Committee has inquired about efforts to analyse the impact to ensure future regulations are informed by such learning. Indeed, this issue was raised directly with officials at the briefing on the 20th of January. I would ask the Minister to ensure that moving forward, the Committee receives these rules in a more timely manner, alongside an analysis of the expected impact that the easing of or the putting in place of restrictions would have. This will provide assurance that lessons have been learned and that restrictions are being eased or put in place appropriately. At the briefing by officials on 20 January, the Committee sought clarity on a number of issues, including under Regulations 5 and 5A, the rules for indoor gatherings. A number of members also sought clarity in relation to the rules for click and collect, 
and highlighted some concerns of an uneven playing field between smaller independent retailers and multinationals. The committee were advised that the executive were further considering this issue, and I would be grateful if the minister could outline progress on that matter. As previously discussed, members have concerns about the limitations of post hoc scrutiny and the continuing approach of legislating without formal consultation and impact assessment. It is acknowledged, however, that this opportunity for debate allows members to place on record their views and we trust it will inform subsequent regulations. I would just like to make a couple of very brief remarks as, as Sinn Féin spokesperson for health. Um, Firstly, to say that we recognise these restrictions are necessary and they are designed to stop chains of transmission. We also all understand that these powers would not be necessary except that there is a pandemic. However, there is, I suppose, um, a growing understanding that a cycle of lockdowns and easements is not sustainable and has negative consequences. The developments with vaccines are hugely welcome and I think do provide a uh, certainly scope for hope that, that the, the worst days of this can be behind us. However, I think we all recognise that given um, the current situation with new variants across the world, that there is no certainty with vaccines and that we still need to maintain the other public health measures and indeed to, to reinforce and increase um, that strategy of find, test, trace, isolate and support. And that this needs to be uh, kept in parallel with, with positive developments around the vaccines. Um, Shane, I pray will ask you to thank you for that. Thank you. Um, before I call the next member, Mr Buckley, I just want to tell members I have Mr Buckley, Ms Hunter, Ms Bradshaw, Ms Nakillen, and Mr McNulty on my list. Mr Carroll, if any other member is wishing to speak or to participate in the debate, if they could please rise in their place, I will add them to my list. Mr Buckley. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And again, I start this debate, as we all have in the weeks that we relate, relate to the coronavirus regulations, by placing on record my sincere thanks to all of those healthcare professionals who continue to play their part in controlling this virus and trying to tend to those who have succumbed to it. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, it goes without saying that they still continue to face uh, considerably high pressure points across the different uh, hospital sites across Northern Ireland and indeed even across the United Kingdom. Um, the, the regulation before us today is a rule that amends the date that the Department of Health must review the need for the restrictions and requirements imposed by Regulation 3 of the Principal Regulations to on or before the 18th of February 2021. The rule also amends the expiry date detailed in Regulation 15 of the Principal Regulations to midnight on the 5th of March 2021. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, as we have on previous occasions and we debate the, the health regulations, it is key to note that, as the Minister has said, that restrictions in themselves have helped to bring infection rates down, but we must be ever mindful of the other impacts across our society that continued lockdowns and restrictions are having. We must remain vigilant and do what we can to ensure that we can control the virus, but also indeed look to those other sectors and how we can best support them. I do take great heart, as many members will in this chamber, in relation to the vaccination programme. And I have, and I will again, place on record uh, my thanks uh, to the Minister and his department, and indeed Patricia Donnelly, for the, the efficient manner in which the vaccination programme is being delivered in Northern Ireland. You know, we, we can hear uh, plenty uh, in this chamber about what was done wrong and right in relation to COVID-19. Um, we all have different gripes about certain aspects of it. I will not shy away from uh, saying that I do as well. But on the vaccination programme, I think we can look to it with a real sense of pride that um, the United Kingdom has been a world leader in vaccination rollout. And, you know, we have only had to look at the debacle uh, last week, I think it was, in relation to the AstraZeneca debate across Europe. Thankful that the United Kingdom had sufficient supply change chains in place and that Northern Ireland has reaped the benefits of their membership of the United Kingdom, where we see in our society being vaccinated at a record-breaking speed. And I do hope that those difficulties per pertaining to the European Union and the rollout of the vaccine uh, can be solved and solved soon to ensure that we can get a general society back to some form of normality. 
Um, but there is more work to be done on the vaccination programme, and that is a conversation that we need to continue to have about those at-risk sectors and how we can best uh, bring society back to normalisation. And I think I do indeed think of that teaching uh, population across Northern Ireland because the untold impact on our young people throughout COVID-19, I think members right across this chamber can agree with me, it really has been devastating. And unfortunately, we will only truly see those difficulties in the years ahead when it may be too late to intervene. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I'm mindful of what you have said and looking at these regulations and the power that was put in place for police to send people home. I think it is important that we do note that it is important that we have this debate here today uh, in relation to the, the placing of the COVID re restrictions. Uh, there's been, without doubt, the COVID regulations have been a difficult matter to police. It's been a difficult adjustment for how we deal with it, uh, both in terms of uh, police having to operate in ways in which we never thought they would having to intervene in situations that they themselves never thought that they would have to. And I do make reference to, undoubtedly, the Ormo Road incident at the weekend was difficult for the PSNI, especially given the need to respect the fact that there was grieving families and what was a horrible atrocity, a historical atrocity of the Troubles. And I think that should be in the fore uh, set of, of all of our minds. But however, I also have to say, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that my thoughts are also with those regular officers, those routine officers that have had to deal with a situation that is, is new to them and new to society, and they've had to intervene and get involved in matters which, in their normal day of policing, they never could have envisaged. Um, Could I ask the member just to resume his seat just briefly? I'm sorry. Um, I'll just remind the House. Standing Order 73 states, Members shall not in any proceedings of the Assembly refer to any matter in respect of which legal proceedings are active within the meaning of Section 2 of the Contempt of Court Act 1981, except to the extent permitted by the Speaker. I just would urge Members to just tread carefully. Thank you, Speaker, and I will, and I will make no specific reference to the individual that was arrested on that ongoing matter. Uh, but as has been set out in this House in the matter of the day this morning, it is right that this House debates this because it's in the very context of coronavirus regulations that we must. You know, I, I do say this, and it's in relation to placing in general of the COVID regulations, and in particular at the weekend. I do find it disgraceful, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, that we seem to have an element of placing by social media pressure and by perceived political pressure. We have seen, and I don't say, I say, these, I don't say these words lightly, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, but in my opinion, we have seen weak, lily-livered leadership from senior PSNI officials in how these COVID regulations are being dealt with. I mean, the irony of it all that the PSNI should receive phone calls from the Deputy First Minister Michelle O'Neill in relation to placing of coronavirus regulations, given that among most she was a chief rule breaker in the Bobby Story funeral. It's something that this House has to take reference of. We really have to look at it because if we are sending PSNI officers by means of these regulations to enforce, to have conversations with, general members of the public and how they abide to them, it is important that there is a consistent approach. Unfortunately, and I think members right across the House will agree that that sadly has been missing and something that has sowed seeds of confusion and, and um, it has also led to a, a real level of trust um, in relation to how the PSNI operate on these matters. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I want to talk about the need for, for, for financial support and to prepare the roadmap for the reopening of our economy. This is something that has been debated time and time again in the House, and I hope the Minister can maybe shed some light in relation to, in particular, uh, the click and collect services and the ability in which we can find a way that independent retailers can um, receive the, the necessary support that they need to get through this difficult time. Because I did mention in last week's debate about the need 
for us to recognise that there very much is an unlevel playing field out there in relation to the independent small retailer and the large multinational. It's something that I think this House should have had a grip of quite some time ago, but unfortunately, and I do understand that there had been a working group which was outlined by the junior ministers last week. Perhaps the minister can give us an update on that, because I think it's essential for public confidence that a, we, we fund those independent retailers in a way in which we'll keep them closed, or we look to some sort of limited form of click and collect that can facilitate um, those businesses to sell stock which is withering on the vine. Its value is going down day on daily by their inability to sell. And I think we, we really do need to look at ways in which we can support them. We also need to look at further economic packages in which we can provide uh, our, uh, those different sectors that have been affected by COVID-19 so that post-COVID-19 that they can thrive and return to our high street in a way which is befitting. Restrictions, as the Minister has mentioned, has had a positive impact on infection rates. But my fear has always been at what is the impact of other elements of our society. Our children and young people, as I have been mentioned, have been, had such a a tremendous impact upon them and upon their families and the inability sometimes to cater for their educational needs as would have been the normal in everyday teaching. I do think it is also time that, and I, I really think this conversation needs to be had and it's something that we had quite considerable debate on the last time the COVID regulations were here. It's in relation to uh, restoring the or have, starting the groundwork for rebuilding and restoring normal services. And I particularly mentioned cancer services, something that really has touched me throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, to see people that are, that are suffering. And they're suffering because, as I did mention, maybe for fear or, of coming presenting themselves to GPs or the difficulties that that pertains in relation to COVID-19 but also their fear that they don't want to come to, to A&E's door because they don't want to overwhelm an already busy health service. I think we really do need to get the message out there that our, our services are open for those that are suffering from cancers. Cancer de uh, detection still are lagging well behind normal levels. The Northern Ireland Can Cancer Registry in its December update said that from the 1st of March to the 5th of December 2020, the number of patients with a patho path or pathology uh, sample indicating cancer was 19% lower than the average number for the same time period uh, in 2017 to 2019. Based upon the monthly trends in patients with a pathology samples indicating cancer, there was an estimated shortfall, Mr Deputy Speaker, of 1,300 patients during March to November 2020 compared uh, to the expected number. Some of these missing patients uh, may have had clinical diagnosis only. So I do think there is a need for us to have this discussion. It's important that we try to restore non-COVID services uh, as quickly as possible to see to it that those vulnerable people in our society can have the service which they do indeed deserve. Uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I'd like to close on the note, and perhaps it is time that we started to have this conversation, albeit that we're not out of the woods yet in relation to COVID-19. And I do look on, as the Chair has noted, in relation to some of the worrying developments with regards to different variants. I particularly think of the Brazilian variant and indeed the South African one. And perhaps maybe the Minister can relay some of the fears of the House today in relation to the effectiveness and efficiency of, or the efficacy of the AstraZeneca uh, vaccination in particular and others to those variants, and how we as a society can adjust our pathway to recovery um, on that basis. And I do hope that we can begin the conversation of whereas we can start to plot and chart a road map to recovery for our society, in particular with schools, with our economy, and indeed with our health service, because it is important, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that we give people hope. I think that is something that many look forward to in 2021, albeit it hasn't come at the pace in which they would have thought. But it is essential now that we do look, I feel, beyond the blunt instrument of restrictions. I do understand how a restriction does have a positive impact on infection levels, but equally, the, the myth that restrictions kill this virus 
you know, and if the society abides by it by a certain length of time, that it will go away is in itself a myth, because we have all seen the repeat cycles. So it is important that we look to a roadmap to recovery that supports and enables sections of society that have been grossly impacted by the coronavirus re restrictions and regulations, but also noting the fact, and I do indeed note it, the impact that it has on infection levels. So on that, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I'd like to thank you for uh, giving me the way to speak. Thanks. Thank you, members. As there is literally just five minutes uh, to go until question time, uh, I propose to suspend this sitting of the Assembly until 2 p.m. for question time. Um, this debate will continue after questions to government ministers when the next speaker will be Ms. Cara Hunter. Thank you. The sitting is suspended by your leave. Okay, members, we'll now resume the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2 Amendment Regulations, and I call Cara Hunter. Here I'm sorry, Cara Hunter on Kenya. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, and I'd like to thank the Minister for being here today. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to speak again uh, on the health protection regulations, specifically 12, 17, 19 and 22. These restrictions are perhaps among the most difficult. They greatly impact upon all of our daily lives and our everyday movements. It is very regrettable that we remain in a similar situation as it stands today, 11 months into this pandemic, both in terms of the virus itself and continued cycles of lockdown. Of course, these restrictions are not put in place lightly, and we support the executive and the minister in the difficult decisions which they have had to make to protect lives and to beat this virus. The sacrifices made by the public over the past number of weeks have not been in vain. We are now beginning to see, slowly but surely, an improvement with figures now showing a lower number of daily cases of infection and a lower R number than at the start of this year. Along with a fantastic process with the rollout of the vaccine, I think we can all take um we can all take heart in these developments. Despite this positive news, we do still have some way to go, and I continue to urge the public to adhere to the restrictions and the guidelines. We continue to recognise the gravity of the public health crisis and the immense continued pressures which the NHS and frontline staff are facing day in and day out. As a member of the Health Committee, I am also aware of the pressures arising right across the health system as a result of this crisis, not just frontline uh, front staff. It has been a long and difficult winter, and as we approach the one-year mark since the first lockdown last March, it does not seem to be getting in any easier to adapt to this way of life. Hopefully, however, once this phase of current restrictions is lifted in the coming weeks, we will never have to return to such a way of life again. Mr Deputy Speaker, as I have done when speaking on the health re protection regulations before and again today, I would like to mention the impact of lockdown that these regulations in particular have had on mental and emotional well-being. I think that the lack of contact with our family, our friends and the need to stay home, which these restrictions require and enforce, has been one of the most difficult and in some cases indeed painful experiences of the pandemic over the last year. The sense of isolation and loneliness, which many people will have experienced, must be dreadful, and particularly those of the elderly community, the disabled, and those living in rural areas who may have already found themselves cut off and isolated regardless of the pandemic. I continue to press the Minister of Health and his department to act and work now as a plan, to put a plan in place to deal with the anticipated mental health crisis um, that we anticipate coming out of this pandemic. An aspect of this which we discussed last week was on the Health Committee's recent report into care homes. In that debate, we all reflected across this House on the difficulties that care homes have, had, uh, ha have experienced, and the report certainly brought home to me the stark realities of what life has been like for residents and families, and indeed the effects on people not being able to visit, uh, see, touch and hug their loved ones. One other point that I would like to make is from my own constituency viewpoint uh, in the constituency of East Derry, and it relates specifically to Regulation 19. 
I have been contacted by a number of constituents and residents at seaside resorts within my constituency, Port Ballantrae, Port Rush and Port Stewart. They have been frustrated to see people coming from far and wide to stay in their holiday homes, and I deeply understand their frustrations. While I would reiterate that no one would ever seek to stop or limit anybody's right to exercise, I would ask that the public stay in and around their own areas in fear of inadvertently spreading this virus. Of course, in normal times, tourists and visit visitors are very welcome in our towns in East Derry, and indeed these towns are very much dependent on the tourism market. Hopefully those two days are not too far away either, but for now I again urge people to adhere to the guidance around travel. I would also emphasise a number of constituents have voiced to me uh, the importance of team sports and the regular gym attendance for their mental and emotional well-being. I do hope that as lockdown lifts, the department and the PHA will continue to engage with both the gym industry and sports groups directly to ensure health and safety can be adhered to and that these important aspects of our lives can safely resume as soon as possible. I will conclude, Mr Speaker, by putting forward to the Minister a question around COVID-19 testing staff, the possibility of could they be included uh, in the vaccine as their front line and at high risk group. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, they're on zero hour contracts and have deep concerns as they don't receive sick pay if they were to contract the virus. But lastly, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I would like to conclude by saying that my party and I are supportive of the regulations before us today. And I'm sure like all members across the House, regret the need for such stringent measure measures at this time and can only hope that the end is somewhere close in sight. Thank you. I now call Alan Chambers. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, during the uh, run-up to the Christmas period uh, just passed, the executive had a huge challenge to try and balance the ongoing transmission of COVID against the desire to try and facilitate a Christmas celebration of sorts for all of us. These relaxations, while widely welcomed by the community, resulted in a negative impact in relation to transmission rates. It was inevitable that a robust reaction was required to counter this. And what is before us today is that robust reaction. It is commendable that, in line with these regulations, the main churches made the huge gesture of voluntarily cancelling acts of public worship in line with them. The virus and the resulting regulations has changed everyone's way of life. Individuals and families are making huge sacrifices to comply with restrictions that are designed to protect all, all our well-being and also to relieve the pressure on our NHS. At least 95 per cent and maybe more of our citizens are complying fully, but some are still ignoring the restrictions. It is regrettable that ignoring of regulations has, in many cases, involved those who have been responsible for helping to craft them. The disruption to our daily lives will be lifted or relaxed in response to a slowdown of transmission and hospital admissions. That is in our hands. The efficient and speedy rollout of the vaccine will make a huge contribution to getting back to normal, but our daily behaviour is still crucial. The reason welcome downward trends should not be taken as an excuse to let our personal or collective guard down. All of us in this House have been lobbied by various sectors to be allowed to reopen. Gym sessions are very important to those who enjoy the health and well-being benefits of a visit to the gym, and there has been a robust campaign to lobby us to support a reopening of these establishments. I, I must confess that a, a visit to a gym is not as important to me at the moment as a visit maybe to the barber or my wife to her hairdresser. All these personal service businesses have spent money and effort in making a visit to their premises as safe as possible. But the barrier to being able to get the public back into these businesses is the need to minimise travel that may have the potential for accidents that could lead to more pressure on our hospitals. Earlier this afternoon, the First Minister reiterated the need for us to stay at home. That advice is the cornerstone of these regulations. The big prize for our sacrifices will be the reduction or the elimination of deaths to this virus. 
but also the fact that the important programme of elective surgery can get back to normal. In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, an earlier speaker referred to these regulations as being a blunt instrument. Nobody could argue with that description. In normal times, no one in a democratic society would in any shape or form add their name to support the restrictions we are currently living under. They are indeed a blunt instrument, but in this case they have saved a number of lives that we will never be able to quantify. For that reason alone, we should all have no difficulty in supporting the restrictions in front of us today. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Paula Bradshaw. Mr Deputy Speaker, again, of course, we find ourselves discussing regulations long after they apply. In this particular instance, we are looking at a reversion fundamentally to something closer to the regulations when they initially came into force last March. The main headline in these regulations is to stay at home. It's an order, um, now it clearly implies, and that it now may be enforced. Mr Deputy Speaker, we probably do need to ask ourselves how we are still getting hundreds of cases every day when the numbers now being reported represent a period after these regulations came into force. In other words, they represent a period during which a stay-at-home order has applied in law throughout. In such circumstances, how, in fact, are infections taking place? This is a question to which I do feel the Minister should have an answer. We have heard little about contact tracing in recent weeks, um, but it should be able, to find, be able to answer that question. If infections are happening in the home, the question then still arises how they are moving between homes when there is a stay-at-home order in place. If infections are happening in offices, the question arises whether all these offices need to have people in them. If they are happening in shops, then the question arises whether we need to implement improved social distancing measures. I commend the vast majority of people who are staying at home, except for um, essential journeys, because this is an exceptionally grim time of year during which we have to do it. I hope sincerely that the advances made by the vaccination programme are helping people keep their spirits up, but this is a difficult task. I also applaud the workplaces where people have ensured um, that staff can work from home. I know of many instances where this has not been straightforward to make it a reality. I have to say I am impressed particularly by those shops who have invested in having staff on hand at the entrance to try to ensure guidelines such as one person only are adhered to. But we continue, as so often during this pandemic, to be operating in an information vacuum. Where are the ongoing problems causing the infections actually? I hope the Minister can provide us not just with an outline, but with some detail about what contact tracing is telling, and therefore what precisely those who provide the public health advice have been asked to consider for the coming weeks. I hope, Mr Deputy Speaker, arising from that, you will allow me to, leeway, uh, to touch on Amendment 2, also which re um, indicates a review will now take place ahead of potential changes on 5th of March. This is why we need to hear from the Minister how exactly this will be managed and what information will feed into the consideration of the next steps. There is a balance to be struck between, on one hand, holding the current line um, until at the very least, all the clinically vulnerable have been vaccinated, and perhaps beyond that, to give the vaccination programme itself the maximum chance of succeeding. And on the other hand, enabling limited opening of lower risk and high benefit locations. Most obvious amongst these are schools, of course, but I accept that this is not a matter to which the Health Minister can give a direct answer. Other facilities, however, would include leisure centres, general retail, gym and libraries, which are essential to mental well-being and can be managed in a way which limits risk markedly. I would ask the Minister what information is being considered with regard to the now imminent review of the restrictions and would it not be advantageous if members of this House and indeed the public could see that information. Otherwise, we are even more limited in our role as scrutineers than we already are, having to debate these regulations so long after they are already applied. Mr Deputy Speaker, with some reluctance, given the relative absence of information and the ongoing difficulties being caused by so many of them, I commend the, rec or sorry, the regulations in the hope that we have seen the last peak of infections. Um, there will be something very wrong if we have not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. 
Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak on the health regulations as well. And like the speakers that went before me, um, certainly there are concerns regarding the fact that, I mean, just the point that Paula had finished on, I think people are with goodwill and all the best intentions are supporting these regulations, but there are concerns around the ability to scrutinise after the fact. Um, but I, and I know the, the ministers in front of the committee on Thursday, so perhaps some of the questions that I raise here today you'll be able to pick up upon um, in regard to these regulations and indeed future programmes of work. I also think it's really important um, that every member that I've listened to so far has pointed to the fact that they really welcome the vaccination process and its rollout. I also note today that numbers of people infected are starting to decrease, and that in itself has to be really welcomed, not just for the individuals and their families, but certainly our health and social care staff, who, to be quite frank, from last year are an already beleaguered workforce, but from last year have actually stood up and stood up even when they felt like laying down. And I think for that reason and that reason alone, um, we all welcome that progress. There are, as the, the Minister will know better than most, massive pressures on other parts of health and social care. And not so much about the restrictions around COVID, um, being able to you know, practice safe social distancing, but equally, the growing lists of people who are waiting on surgery continues to grow. It was already at a worrying rate prior to COVID, and now you know, there are massive and real concerns about those. So if the, the minister doesn't mind even just some information regarding those updates when he appears at the committee on Thursday. The other issue that we've been really concerned about, and indeed um, the impact of the, the COVID regulations, um, not just on the life and liberty of people, but some of the, 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 I suppose the issues that our health and social care staff are dealing with, and that's around safeguarding. I've been speaking to some of the people in education, particularly in primary education, and the numbers of concerns that they normally would progress to social services have dropped because of children in school, and that's really, really worrying. So if the, the minister could bring some issues forward and our uh, Sinn Féin team on health are meeting with the Children's Commissioner tomorrow um, and certainly not just about this issue but certainly other issues and the other issues that Cara has mentioned indeed others have mentioned is the impact on mental health has gone through the roof. We were talking to some young people who right across North Belfast have worked in interfaces for years and that's a, that's a hard station for anyone. But one of the biggest challenges that they said they faced, even through the whole period of unwanted bonfires in my own constituency, was around the mental health, poor mental health of young people. Um, and they're certainly looking at perhaps developing protocols as easements hopefully happen to try and get more work because kids are zoomed out and they're actually zooming out. They're withdrawn, they're isolated and they're, they're down. And that's something I don't think any of us want. And I believe that, you know, certainly with the, the vaccination, pro certainly. Thank the member for giving way. And she touches on a, a very important point in relation to the impact on our young people, particularly some people can think for within a school setting, but equally, as she has outlined, also those in a community setting. Would the member agree with me in, in a, as we chart the road to some form of recovery, that it is important that we look at innovative ways in which our youth sector can provide uh, help towards those that have missed vital education and early learning experiences within school. There must be a joint up process by where those two uh, different arms of the educational body pull together to ensure that those young people who will bear the scars, both mentally and indeed educationally, in the days ahead. Well, there's, and I thank the member for his intervention. There's nothing he said that I would disagree with. Um, and the point that I was making was that the youth providers themselves are trying to look at a protocol, bearing in mind the current health restrictions, but at the same time, they've got real concern about the impact that these regulations are having on the health and wellbeing of young people. Um, I mean, everything that we have talked about has been around test, trace, isolate and support. And I think that needs to be the watchwords and continue to be the watchwords 
where I am really, really concerned is, I mean, I understand the, and I appreciate the fact that those travelling, particularly from Britain, there's exemptions around film and TV crews and other professions that are exempt from self-isolation. But I still can't get my head around the fact that when we, weeks ago, had the Kent variant, that the minister didn't support it and, and instead opted for guidelines. And I think that's a decision we're going to come to rue, to be honest. We have brought in regulations against other variants from other red flag countries. But I, I just wish that we could pass thinking constitutionally and think about health. And that is something I want to take up with the Minister on Thursday. I also believe that the current restrictions are inadequate and we definitely need to see more detail. We need to see certainly more detail around passenger locator forms for all arrivals at ports and airports. In my opinion, there is a real need for requirement for managed quarantine and COVID testing for departure or pre-departure, in my opinion, needs to be introduced. I also um, appreciate the fact that none of this is easy. These are decisions that people are having to make. But I also believe, and, and having to make when people are being, you know, they're lying in ICU. And that's something that focuses all. But one thing that's very clear to me is that restrictions, particularly if you look at the figures today, have worked to a certain degree. So what we're asking for is not only just further updates in terms of our ability to scrutinise, but also what the recovery, recovery plan will be. Because alongside of this, while people have been very tolerant, and indeed, uh, despite the uncomfortableness of these regulations from their, their introduction, people have done their best. Um, but I, I do think we're at a stage now where we need to see uh, a recovery a recovery plan, albeit on the basis that it's on the basis that health restrictions ease when health improves. And I think that's, you know, people need that hope. And it's not just your business to provide that hope, but since we're discussing these health regulations, I would like you to take um, some of the points I've raised up. I will say I was disappointed earlier at the tone of Jonathan. Buckley in relation to the Ormer Road. I mean, I think there is a big contrast between people involved in silent prayer laying flowers in reflection to that of the crowds in East Belfast. They weren't there to lay flowers or pray. They were there to intimidate, harm, bully, continue their criminality, including drugs, racketeering and all the rest. And I don't think it serves them well you know, just to focus on that issue and that issue alone. I think what we need to see here is, to be quite honest, um, I think we need to see as much, um, as many people as possible, looking at these health regulations and trying their best in the circumstances of health. And where there are difficulties, then separate them and deal with them separately. Um, I don't think it did any people in East Belfast who were living in terror any justice either. Um, and I'll finish with this, Minister. I am delighted to be on the Health Committee. I am delighted to be working with great people on the committee who have just, you know, you can, I can tell that even when it comes to this, regulations actually struggle but are trying to do their best. But I would say that we need, we need to see a bit more um, evidence. We also need to see more detail. Um, because I don't think anybody has been really mischievous over these things. I think they're trying to be collegiate. But I do think, uh, and I actually I'm feeling it, and I'm only on the committee, that there needs to be more coming to not help them to support you, but, but also um, knowing all the problems, which we do, because we ask just numerous questions, we also need to see what the resolution and some of those problems is going to be. And I think that's something if you haven't started already, even if it's work in progress, we would need to certainly see it. Because like yourself, we're constituency representatives who have come through a lot over decades. But this last year, in my opinion, has impacted on some of the most hardy people I know. Some of the most brave uh, staff working in health and social care who have worked in NEs at the worst of times and who are actually considering their profession. And that's not something any of us want. 
but I would like to see. So they are also asking questions like they understand restrictions in one area, but they don't understand in another area. So, for example, the travel around the camp area didn't go down well. And I think those questions need to be answered. Um, so, thank you very much. Aram, er, Justin McNulty, Hunt Kanchi. I call Justin McNulty. Kuramai August Flas Kamkarla. As others have stated, the issue before us today is a mere extension of the regulations previously put in place. We have been here on a number of occasions before, and that these regulations are almost at review stage before they get to this House for consideration, debate, and ultimate approval. I supported the extension at the time and want to take this opportunity to speak to the review of the regulations coming next week. Lashkan Korla, we know the regulations have worked and continue to work, and whilst the infection rates and number of positive cases continues to fall, it remains high and, most importantly, the pressure on our health service, our hospitals and our healthcare teams remains high as well. The review will take into account the impact on hospitals on healthcare staff, on cancelled surgeries, on delays in screening, and on the rollout of vaccinations. And indeed, the most up to date hospital admission details will also be uh, included in those considerations. So many people and their families are sitting at home sick with worry about delays in surgeries and lack of access, perceived or otherwise, to screening. And simple things like a drive in testing site in Uri, Dalbert Basin. There's a storm coming down the line this week, and people have to walk long distances to get into the testing site. And people want answers, and people want a solution to that situation where there was a drive in testing site and they want to see that um, replaced. However, I would ask the Minister to use this opportunity to review, and of, or sorry, this opportunity of his review to signal a path for the future, to give people a sense of hope on the horizon. I would appeal that a stage-by-stage -stage pathway be set mm -hmm. out that would see different sectors and activities ease out of restrictions. In calling for this, I do not see this as an undermining of the health message, as I fully appreciate and acknowledge that any easements will be slow, staged and only permissible as the infection and hospital figures permit. I do believe we need to look at easing areas of the, of the economy and society that can be eased in a managed and safety compliant way. I have raised on multiple occasions my concerns around the impact of the cessation of youth sports for prolonged periods. I have raised it with the mental health champion last week at the Education Committee. I have raised it on many occasions with the Minister. I am really concerned about the impact on their mental health, on their emotional health and on their physical health. I know a strong campaign has been launched this week where a number of sporting organisations and high profile figures will be sharing their, their, those concerns. And I am completely sympathetic to those concerns. I want to hear the, the Health Minister's view on that. I want to hear the CMO's view on that. I want to know when they think it will be safe to open up youth sports in a safe and managed way, when, at no risk to the children involved, at no risk to the families of the children involved as well. Outdoor activities such as children's sports can be permitted at an early stage and should be permitted at an early stage, given that they are taking place in outdoor and in open spaces. This, I believe, as I said, is imper imperative for the physical and mental health and emotional well-being of our young people. And, Minister, like many other members here, I am dying to get back into the gym. It has been too long since I have had a bar on my back. Other areas of our economy, such as barbers, hairdressers, which operate on a strict appointment-only basis, or indeed car washers, could be eased. And when can dance lessons and music lessons resume when it is safe to do so? And in education, I believe school leaders and parents alike are crying out for certainty. Minister Weir has already indicated that he will give a period of notice before schools open for face to face learning. But let's give them certainty as soon as possible. Set a date provisionally, give them a timeline or a staggered programme of when schools can resume safely and for what year groups. Minister, I think everyone appreciates the challenges you have faced and the way you have led throughout this pandemic. You have not been afraid of making difficult decisions, and whilst others were at each other's throats, you have remained steady and stable. People in our communities have looked to you more than they have looked to the head of government when things were really tough, when things were in the melting pot in relation to this pandemic, to guide the way, and you have done that. 
I would ask that in the regulations you review next week, you seek to give people hope. You seek to give people sight of the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Almost a year into this uh, pandemic, we unfortunately know the, the seriousness of the virus and how deadly and dangerous it is. And I want to offer my sincere condolences uh, to the thousands of people who have lost a loved one during this pandemic. I also want to <coughs> offer my thoughts uh, with everybody in our community Im impacted uh, by this virus. Um, I have repeatedly, Mr. Deputy Speaker, raised the need for this executive to implement a zero COVID strategy in order to tackle this uh, pandemic. And all along, I have been met with ministers um, engaged in obfuscation and deflection. And today, the First Minister repeated that again. Um, and I, I repeat again today, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the only way out of this pandemic uh, to protect people and to avoid lockdown yo yo uh, is to uh, adopt a zero COVID approach, which aggressively targets this virus and aims for total uh, community transmission uh, to be eliminated. Otherwise, it will be lockdown surge, lockdown surge, lockdown surge for some time. And I don't know if lessons uh, have been learned, um, but I hope there won't be a repeat of the failed strategy of the executive uh, in the past. Uh, Su Susan Michie uh, from University College London, uh, in terms of zero COVID, puts it, I think it's worth quoting, I could use the analogy of fires. In Ireland, there is a zero fire policy, which, mean, which means we want no fires, and we take every measure we can to ensure as much as we can that there are no fires. However, we know fires will occasionally break out, and we have systems in place to jump on those fires quickly so they do not spread into the awful examples we saw in Australia last year. That is what elimination and zero COVID-19 means. I think it's very important and worth uh, considering that uh, today, and at the executive also. Uh, so, whereas we absolutely, Mr. S uh, Deputy Speaker, need measures to in place to protect people's health. Uh, it's my assertion that the executive have been uh, quick, um, slow to implement the measures and quick to uh, lift the measures that has protected people. Uh, and again, I hope lessons have been learned, but I don't know if they have been. Um, I think we also have to say that uh, the executive's approach, in my view, has targeted the wrong people continually. Uh, and more so in the past uh, few weeks. In, in my view, we have had a disproportionate targeting uh, of working class people, including people in my own constituency. Uh, and there, in, in recent weeks, there have been uh, a number of families targeted by, by police as they attempt to mourn uh, for their loved ones who have passed away. So you have a situation where politicians in this chamber can break regulations and not receive a heavy-handed response uh, from the police. MPs can repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly break the regulations uh, and not face any fines, any warrants, any visits uh, or knocks on their door from the police. And not only is such an approach deeply unfair, but will and does breed cynicism amongst a community that has faced so much and sacrificed so much in a very difficult uh, uh, year. Again, something I raised before, but where is the police investigation or door knocks of the big care home providers? And we discussed, obviously, last week the serious amount of deaths that have happened there in response to the, um, the pandemic. Um, again, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I suppose for the Minister's attention, somebody in my constituency last week was fined £200 for giving out bingo cards, uh, you know, some light entertainment. Um, and distraction um, given to people or attempted to give to people in the middle of a pandemic, met with the full rigours uh, of the law, whilst others are <laughs> openly flouting the regulations and getting away with it. It's really disgraceful and shameful stuff. And finally, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I think the issue of capacity in the health service has been raised a number of times, but I think we seriously need to look at uh, private uh, health care capacity. And I, I raised the question with the Minister's uh, department there. Uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, and asked about this in an assembly question. Unfortunately, the response I got was that it's too big of a job, uh, costly and time-consuming, presumably, to find out what is the size and scale of private health care capacity. So I think we need to be saying and seeing and utilising every single private uh, bed, capacity, resources, facilities to tackle this pandemic. Rather than what's happening now is some people are boasting about the profits they're making and the patients they're seeing in the middle of a pandemic, and that approach has to change. And I would urge the minister to come up with a strategy alongside his executive colleagues that discuss how we can take control of those facilities to ensure that it's, uh, they're, they're used to fight this uh, pandemic and deal with the health issues that we have. Thank you. And I call Minister Robin Swan to conclude and wind on the motion, please. Um, <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I, I welcome to today's debate on the amendment to SR number 3, uh, 2021, 
of the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2 regulations. And I want to thank the members for their contributions. And I'll now make uh, just uh, some comments on, on the issues that, that have been raised. In regards to the commentary from, from the Chair, uh, can I again thank the Committee for their support, um, not just in these regulations, but bringing forward the work that, that we have done as a, commi a Committee, uh, as a Department, and bringing forward these regulations. And I think Carolyn McCullen summed it up rightly when she said when she joined the committee, she basically said she could see the passion and the understanding that is there as president of the committee and as something as minister that I, I've noted and welcomed uh, through the support that I've had since, since taking up um, this post. I think the chair was right when he said the vast majority of people do want to do the right thing and do the right thing, and we know that. But these regulations, unfortunately, are necessary, Mr Deputy Speaker, in regards to what additional powers is needed to make sure that those who don't want to do the right thing or those who think they're above the right thing uh, are actually brought to task, um, brought to the rigour of the law. Um, the Chair mentioned, I think it was under Regulation 5, and I think it was something they raised, uh, was raised at the committee as well. Uh, under Regulation 5, a person shall not organise or operate or participate in a gathering of more than six persons from outside two households whereas Regulation 5A prohibits a person who is not an organiser or operator from participating in a gathering, thereby placing the accountability uh, actually on the attendees uh, to larger gatherings as well as the organiser or the operator. The amendment that was made uh, and had reduced 5A was made on the 12th of November uh, and was actually required to close that loophole whereby only the organiser of an event could be fined if many more participants than agreed attended the event. So that piece of work was done. In addition, whilst gatherings of more than six people from more than two households contravenes uh, the requirements of Regulation 5, uh, larger gatherings, or Regulation 5 then covers larger gatherings where actually more enhanced penalties um, can be applied. Uh, the committee chair also raised uh, in, in regards to um, click and collect, as, as did Mr Buckley. Uh, and I will say to members um, that they asked for an update on considerations about widen the use of click and collect. It's something that the Department um, of the Economy has, has tabled a paper to the Executive for consideration. There was a round table headed up by the First and Deputy First Ministers uh, about uh, the widening of use of click and collect to allow non-essential retail to operate um, in that way. I would want to just remind members currently the use of click and collect is restricted to essential retail only, but all retail is able to operate uh, by delivery to customers. And I want to take uh, you back to the intention of these restrictions, and that's the virus transmits where people congregate and have social contact with each other, especially where people are confined to indoor spaces, actually such as shops and shopping centres, and they also may be touching common services as well. So that's the challenge that actually comes with uh, with click and collect. Um, and again, I, th I thank the committee uh, chair for his comments. And also, as in regards to Sinn Féin health spokesperson, in regards, and I think everyone in the house, in regards to the acknowledgement of the vaccine and the vaccine programme, uh, and how we're actually progressing that. But again, like the, the chair stressed as well, vaccine, uh, the vaccine programme, and vaccines will not work on their own. They still need supported uh, by the other additional measures, measures that we all know that work: social distancing, good hand hygiene, good respiratory hygiene, and uh, wearing face coverings. Uh, moving on to the, the, the comments of, of Johnny Buckley, and again, I thank Johnny for his, his constant um, acknowledgement as others of our healthcare professionals who have been working through this, this pandemic uh, now for 11 months. And I think, again, as Karen McCullen mentioned and others mentioned, the, the extreme pressure that they have been on and under um, due to working in an underfunded and under resourced health service for many years. Um, has only been intensified by, by the pandemic uh, in itself. And again, his acknowledgement of the, the, the vaccine programme uh, and that sense of pride that we have here in Northern Ireland um, of what is being delivered, but also the dedication of the staff who are actually working on it and the positive feedback uh, I think that all of us have been getting about the warm, friendly support uh, and encouragement and operation that our vaccine centres are are delivering both the regional ones and the GPs, um, the GP facilities as well. Uh, he raised about you know the f financial support uh, measures that are necessary uh, to supplement um, and complement 
uh, the restrictions that are brought in, and uh, you know, I, I welcome the support that comes from uh, both the ministers of economy and finance in regards to making sure um, that those support measures are there as well and are paid out as quickly and as expediently as possible to make sure that we do get support to those sectors that that I actually need it because um, he did reference to, to those sectors who have been grossly impacted. Um, but I think as Health Minister I would say there's been none more uh, impacted uh, than that in my own in the health service. Um, jo Jonathan also raised the, the issues in regards to the message and uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I think it's important in regards to the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine that's currently out there at the minute and the Chief Medical Officer um, has issued a press release just to give people that reassurance uh, in regards to AstraZeneca and, and I want to read some of it actually into, in, into the record today uh, because Dr McBride has said that the AstraZeneca and Pfizer BioNTech vaccines are protecting people from COVID-19 and they are saving lives. They have been independently and expertly assessed as effective against the strains of the virus that are dominant in Northern Ireland and elsewhere on these islands and they have been approved for the entire um, adult population. Um, he is aware of a small-scale study that suggests that AstraZeneca may not be as effective against mild disease from the South African variant of the virus, but clearly more studies will be required on the full efficacy of vaccines against all variants. But I wish to assure people here on two important fronts. Firstly, the South African variant is not dominant in the UK. Indeed, there have been no confirmed cases of it at all in Northern Ireland at this time. And secondly, while protection against mild disease is obviously desirable, the most important objective is the protection against serious illness, hospitalisation and death, and any vaccine that achieves that is a successful vaccine. So I just wanted to make sure that was, was put on record, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Cara Hunter then moved on to talk about um, how our numbers are now decreasing and how that is a very important part to note. Um, but I will say that we started um, from a very high point. So although our numbers are decreasing, they still have a long way to go before they would get to where, where I would feel comfortable by a wide-scale opening of, of all our activities in Northern Ireland. And I think she reflected that in her own comments when she said there is still some way, some way to go. Mr Deputy Speaker, I, th I think one of the most important points that, that Cara raised, uh, as did others, is that is how this vi virus um, has affected the change in daily lives of many people across Northern Ireland, and that from contact with family and friends. Mr Deputy Speaker, I think one of the most um, moving um, tributes um, that I actually received through our, our vaccine programme um, was when uh, an elderly lady who had been through the process actually indicated that the touch of the vaccinator on her arm um, was the first human contact that she had physically had since this virus started. So when you hear um, moving testimony like that about the impact that this virus has had on daily life in Northern Ireland, it really brings it home and it makes us, I, I think, as, as legislators here, uh, reflect on the necessity of these regulations because of what they are achieving and what they continue to achieve by driving down that rate of infection but also to make sure that we have the necessary support mechanisms um, in place as well. And as I've always said, that they will be in place no longer uh, than are necessary. But Mr Deputy Speaker, at this point in time, they are necessary because we still have a high rate of infection. We still have more people in hospital with COVID than we had at the peak um, of our first, uh, the first wave. And with more people in ICU uh, than we did during our first and second waves, um, so they will. These regulations are, are, in my view, proportionate and necessary at this point in time. You know, and I think another point that, that Cara Hunter raised was in regards to those people who are travelling to seaside resorts for their exercise, which which is perfectly understandable. But if people can do it closer to home, it'd be far better if they did it, and also for the communities that they're travelling to. There is guidance there in regards to how far people should travel from their own, their own place of home. Because the fewer people who do travel or, or make unnecessary trips, if we can get that number down now, the sooner it will be that we can all get back to enjoying those, those trips and, and those outings uh, that we all want to get back to. 
and that I think follows on to, to Mr Chambers' contribution, um, where he said the cornerstone of the regulations that we have in place at the minute is the stay-at-home message and the necessity to, to minimise travel. So that's where many of the challenges, and I think it leads into some of, of Mr McNulty's contributions in regards to all those things that we could open, we could look at opening, and we should look at opening, and I think they have to be taken um, at a steady pace, at a time when the time is right, when the, a time when it doesn't see an explosion of the virus again. And I re, re, will reflect back uh, to the approach the executive actually took back in May, where it set out a stepped, phased approach, but didn't put timeline on it. And those restrictions were eased uh, solely, uh, depending on where the virus was at any point in time, where the pressures on our hospital system was at any point in time as well. And, and uh, I, I think that's an important way to approach how we take the next steps out of this, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Ms Bradshaw indicated, you know, in regards to the number of cases that we are currently seeing, uh, PHA is still working how we collate that and actually present it in a meaningful way as to where we source th those rates of infections, where they still are. And we are still seeing cases in homes and the workplaces that are opened as well. But unfortunately, we're also seeing still outbreaks associated to funerals. Uh, because in Northern Ireland, there still is that that emotional challenge, Mr Deputy Speaker, whereas a funeral is not just a, not just a, a, an acknowledgement of somebody's life, but there's also a social connection as well. So we are still unfortunately seeing those, which, and I think that puts into the challenge, um, and we've often said it in here, but how this virus has changed our perception of death. And those things that were so normal for so many people uh, have now been challenged, and that's why unfortunately we still have that. Um, that challenge and restriction on how many people can attend a funeral uh, when, when the guidance has been followed, because it does make it, it does make it personal, it does make it hard for many families um, to do that. And it's about taking those steps out again, not rushed, but when they are proportionate and in a safe way to do. Um, moving on, Mr Deputy Speaker, to, to Karen McCullen's contribution. And with her contribution, I'm already looking forward to Thursday. No, well, look, it, 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 will be, it will always be an engagement, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that I do look forward to, because I, I think one of the challenges as well that, that Carl will bring to the committee is, all, is also having sat around the executive table in regards to the proportionality and, and the discussions and the decisions that have been made uh, at various times when we do have, ha, have had to make those, those, those difficult decisions and the number of uh, questions that she did ask in regards to that. I, 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 I'll get my best to have those answers um, for the member again. But the, the, the important, um, or one of the important facts that, that uh, was raised, uh, was the importance of our health uh, and social care workforce, the entirety of the family, across the whole health and social care sector, no matter where they are and where they fit into it, and the supports that, that we do need to put in place, um, because they have um, they have stood up when many others. Uh, were all, or would have been on their knees and were on their knees. Um, in regards to, to the mental health uh, challenge and the impact it is saying, it's something that both Ms Nicole and uh, Ms Hunter uh, raised in, in regards as well, and I do remember, you know, in the Executive Committee on Mental Health, Wellbeing, Resilience and Suicide Prevention, uh, again, when Carl was, was Minister, she engaged with, with the youth group that was Elephant in the Room, uh, who provided a very powerful testimony. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to the challenges that this pandemic is putting um, on our young people, and I think it was, um, I, I think it was maybe to paraphrase, you know, that so zoomed in, they've zoned out. You know, we put that reliance, you know, that our young people are spending so much time in front of screens now that it ha almost had become a way of life from them. It was okay when it was there. It was their escape from reality, uh, where they went into play in their their Xboxes or whatever else, but when it's their only way now of communicating with their friends and their social group, it is putting those additional strains uh, on stresses as well, which I think is an important piece of work in, in regards to the initial exchange uh, between Ms Nicole and, and, and Johnny Buckley in regards to what more can be done working across different departments, and the members will be aware of the work that has been done by, by the mental health champion in regards to bringing forward uh, recommendations as well. In regards to passenger, passenger locator form, I, I think we're, we're uh, well rehearsed in here in regards to the concerns that I've raised 
uh, with that lack of sharing of data uh, with the government from the Republic of Ireland. Some of the small steps have been made on, but Mr Deputy Speaker, we're far from, from addressing the real need as to how we identify uh, travellers coming in through the Republic of Ireland who not just are travelling on, on to Northern Ireland but also on to, to Great Britain as well. So there's still a lot of work to be done on, on regards to, to international travel. That has been acknowledged on several times, Minister, but there still is an absence of any sort of positive locator form from east to west. And I think we do need to see, as well as a robust All Ireland an All Ireland approach, we also need to see a robust Both Islands approach. And you had indicated in the, in the run-up to Christmas that you were looking at passenger health locator forms as a way to improve our tracking and management of east-west travel. Is there any update on that? I think one of the things, and uh, uh, to, to update the chair, the, the passenger locator form that we use is a UK passenger locator form. Um, so it's actually managed through the Home Office. Uh, we get our data from that as well. So um, I will up to the, and I, I have been aware that there, are, there has been some media attention around the sharing of passenger locator data um, from GB to the Republic of Ireland. Mr Deputy Speaker, as far as I'm concerned, no formal approach has been made by the Irish Government to the Home Office uh, actually seeking uh, the sharing of that data. Now, that may have changed since, since I received the last update, but as until that approach can be made, it's not within my gift. It has to be for the Irish Government to approach uh, the Home Office about the sharing of that data. So. You know, I'd be supportive to make sure that there is, and I think the chair knows that, as much sharing of data, travel data, especially across these islands, is beneficial. Because if we don't know who's coming in through uh, the Republic of Ireland and travelling here, or coming in through the Republic of Ireland and travelling on to Cardiff, London, Manchester, it does put additional strains um, and stresses as well. Um, moving on, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, in regards, I touched on some of, of Mr McNulty's contributions, and there were so many things he talked about, you know, about opening up and when can we do it. What I would say to the member, you know, let's not get in front of us uh, in regards to putting out the messages. These restrictions are still in place to the 5th of March. What we need, what we need uh, as an executive, what we need in an assembly, and what we need as a society is people conforming with that message, the message which is stay at home. Because if we start to get people in front of themselves about what we're going to open up next, there is a human nature a tendency uh, to get out in front of, of the formal announcement. So I, I would, I I would cause caution restraint in regards to just opening up too much or indicating what we're going to open up and when we're going to open it up so it doesn't have an adverse effect. Um, in regards to, to Mr Carroll's contribution, um, in regards to wanting no fires, um, very, I, I think a very, very apt analogy. Uh, unfortunately, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are still too many people running around society uh, with matches in their pockets. Uh, and it is, I, I think, it's a firm analogy in regards to the virus. Because when you're going about uh, with those matches in your pocket, matches in your hands, you still have that ability to transfer the virus, to start another fire. Should it be in your own home? Should it be in somebody else's home? Should it be in a shop? Should it be in a conversation you're having with somebody down the street without wearing the face mask? So I think it's something that we, we need to want to do. And I'll say to people, you know, that's what reinforces um, that message about staying at home because nobody will intentionally want to burn their own house down by them and their loved ones and their families are in it. So if we can look at the virus as, as, as that analogy that Mr Carl expressed in regards then to the utilisation of the independent sector, it's something that we continue to do and something we continue to work with to pick up whatever capacity uh, we, we can see and whatever we can utilise to to, to perform and support uh, our own health service as well. Mr Deputy Speaker, I hope that I have answered as many of the members' queries and questions as, as possible. And in closing, I, I would like to do two things. The first is to express my thanks and the appreciation of all, as, all of us here today, to all those working across our health um, service during most difficult time. I would like to thank the public for adhering to the guidance and regulations that are in place I know it isn't easy, and so I commend you for your strong support and your contribution in, in reducing the impact of the COVID-19 in our community. The second point, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to make is to remind everyone that the most important actions we can all take to limit the spread of this virus is to stay at home, limit our contact with others, and to isolate from others immediately if we have any symptoms, 
and seek a COVID test. It has made a difference and it continues to make a difference. So I'd say to people, don't give up yet. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend these regulations to the Assembly. Thank you, Minister. Um, the question now is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2 Amendment Regulations NI 2021 be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it and the regulations stand approved. So, members, please now take your ease while we move to the next item of business.